Martin Scorsese said that if he had seen Soy Cuba when it was initially released, when he was an aspiring filmmaker, that would have completely changed his style of filmmaking. And I feel that sort of highlights the forgotten beauty that is Soy Cuba. For those who don't know, Soy Cuba is a 1960s picture co-produced by the Russians and the Cubans shortly after the Cuban Revolution. It was directed by Mikhail Kolotovs and shot entirely in Cuba with a Cuban crew and some Russians sprinkled in there as well. Soy Cuba was intended to be a propaganda piece. It was supposed to show Cuba and how communism was good for it and how capitalism was a huge negative for the country. Since the film was produced by the Russian government and with help with the Cuban government, there was pretty much an endless amount of resources, including a two year shooting schedule, which most movies only get shot over the course of three months. There was even one instance for one of the last shots in the movie where they pulled a thousand soldiers out of their bases so they could march you know, in front of the camera. And this was during the Cuban Missile Crisis. So it's in the middle of the crisis, like, oh yeah, we'll send, you know, a thousand soldiers to help with this movie. So, like, that really shows this, the ridiculous amount of resources they had to make this movie. If you look at some of the behind the scenes photos, you can even see a Fidel Castro on set watching the dailies, you know? Like, if that doesn't tell you the sort of government connections they had when making the movie, then I don't know what will. The director, Mikhail Kolotovs, was able to get his hands on this infrared film stock which before then was only used for night photography. The uh, infrared film stock adds a very interesting look to the picture. It makes all the trees this pure white color and the skies are like pure black. You know, it's this very uh, almost off-putting imagery created by this infrared. Another piece of equipment that they had access to was this lens coating used on Russian submarines, which was used on the telescopes so they could be used underwater. And in the picture, is actually used extensively for a lot of underwater shots. In fact, I think, yeah, it's this shot right here, where it goes underwater, and they get this fantastic shot, where it's set up all the way on top of the hotel building, and it goes all the way underwater. And this was sort of done with the submarine coating. So that's some of the equipment they used for the movie, but by far the most recognizable thing from the picture is its use of handheld. 90% of the movie was shot on handheld with an 8mm lens. 8 to 10mm lens was the primary range of lenses in the picture. Which lends this very intense, high action feel, which is so strange because it's also, in a lot of the interviews, they talk about wanting to make a poetic film, you know, a romantic film. And when you think about the poetic, romantic type of movies, it's slower, more methodical. They put Vaseline on the lens. They use the longer lenses, you know, things like that. But with this, they kind of went the exact opposite route. You know, they did the crazy wide eight millimeter, like insanely wide. And the, like just the amount of times they move the camera and it just this rhythmic flow to the picture. And when you compare Soy Cuba to its peers, you know, to the movies that were made around the same time, all of them had this tripod look, long lenses, which there's nothing wrong with that. You know, I love tripods. This is one on a tripod right now. I, it works, but I feel like Alan has been a movie since Soy Cuba that has had that same passion. You know, I think there's one thing I would say, I feel like Soy Cuba is a film about passion. And I think that's really connected to the sort of national respect that it's about. It's about a sort of patriotism. It's about, you know, love of your country. You know, it's about sort of dying for your country and dying for what you believe in and, you know, what you think is the right thing. Revolution and passion, they go hand in hand. So I think that's kind of lends a lot to the picture is that passion. And since Soy Cuba, I don't think there's been a single picture that's even gone close to that level of impact. So what makes Soy Cuba so interesting is that, you know, unlike all the other movies that came and made their mark on cinema and are heralded for decades to come, Soy Cuba came and appeared unlike any other movie before it. It was so radically shot. The anthology kind of story of it is so interesting. The, the way that 
the Cuba, the nation has a voice is so interesting. And I haven't seen that in another picture and sort of lends credence to the, I don't even want to say patriotism because it's not, it's not patriotism because it's revolution and that's almost the opposite. It's, it's almost a, a higher level patriotism, you know? Patriotism not to the people of the country, but to the country itself. And that's sort of an aspect of Soy Koopa, that this country, that this land and this sort of accumulation of the people's dreams, you know, is in its thing a person, which I find so interesting. But regardless of all that, regardless of all the things that did to change cinema, it didn't. It didn't leave a mark on anyone. It was screened for a week or two in Havana and Moscow, and it was commercially panned and critically, people hated it. So they took it out of the theaters and it wasn't screened again for another 30 years. When they screened it in Havana, where the film was shot, people hated it because they thought it was such a sort of stereotypical view of Cuba. And Moscow, they sort of saw it as overly naive and they saw it as too sympathetic to the bourgeoisie. You know, as they stated at the time. So after they uh, took it out of the theater, no one saw it for another 30 years. It stayed in Moscow, you know, in some historian museum. And then in Havana, I don't even think there was a copy left in Havana, really. So 30 years came and went. No one knew about Soy Cuba. And just think about it from the 70s to the 90s. And like when people think about film, that's the time, you know, like. That's like the, some of the best movies ever made came from the 70s to 90s. Well, more like the 70s, I like the 70s, as you know, if you've seen any of my videos. But uh, yeah, so like the fact that Soy Cuba was not even in the discussion at all. No film school, nobody even mentioned Soy Cuba at all because they didn't know it existed. No one knew it existed. It was completely lost to time. And it wasn't until 1992, I think, where it screened at a film festival that was sort of celebrating the work of Mikhail Kolotovsk, because he's a very renowned and respected Russian director, one of the top five, top 10 perhaps. Someone there was sort of a friend of Coppola and Scorsese, so they showed it to them and they loved it, so they're oh, we gotta get this out there. And then, so that's when Scorsese said, if I had seen this when I was younger, it would have completely changed my view on cinema and I would have been a completely different director. And Scorsese's saying that, you gotta imagine, like what could have been, you know, if Soy Cuba screened in the States, you know, because I think, even now, I don't think the Cubans like it all that much, or the Russians. Well, I don't know about the Russians, but I don't think the Cubans like the movie all that much. But what if it came out in the 60s in America and it was just a stellar hit, you know? And who knows, it, it, might, it might not have been. But if it was just known to, you know, the giga film fans, you know, how would film changed, you know? Because there was just, like, even in the 70s, it's very much tripod centric heavy. It's very long lens heavy, you know? So it's just, and like, people talk about French New Wave, like Breathless, and I love Breathless. But I feel like this blows it out of the park in terms of, cause like, yeah, Breathless has the jump cuts and there's a little bit of handheld and a little bit of wide shots. But like, Soy Cuba is like, you know, the French New Wave times 10 in terms of innovation, I think. So it's thinking about if it had been known to the film public earlier, just how completely different film history would have become. Because I just find it really, really interesting. Because I don't know any other movie that was so crazy out there and then was completely uninfluential and just totally forgotten about for decades. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you're interested in seeing Soy Cuba and you haven't seen it, I'll leave a link below to uh, the Ultimate Edition, which I really like because it has Soy Cuba. And it also has this documentary about Soy Cuba called The Siberian Mammoth, which is a fantastic film. The director of the movie goes to all the actors and crew members after the revival, like in 1992 when they screened it again and Scorsese and Coppola re-released on home video. And they didn't even know, like the, the cast and crew didn't even know about its revival. So you get to see like their reaction to its newfound success. So, which is an absolutely like beautiful thing to see. So I would highly recommend watching the Siberian Mammoth if you enjoy Soy Cuba. And if you haven't seen Soy Cuba, I would highly, highly, highly recommend you watch it. So that's all for this video. Thanks for watching. Like, comment, subscribe. Hit the bell if you want more film videos like this. Uh, if there's any other particular films you want me to talk about, or if there's any questions that you have about Soy Cuba, uh, just comment down below and I'll try to answer as many as possible. Thanks for watching and hope to see you again soon.
Peace out.